And it's always great to share the stage with Sam Spade and my special guest this evening to talk about the subject of populism. Uh, I've, I've shared the stage before with Cornell Clayton and he's a terrific speaker. He's the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute for Public Policy and Public Service at Washington State University. And also with us, Nick Barr Klingen. He's with the University of Washington where he directs the international programs uh, for the Comparative History of Ideas program. And we are here to talk about populism. It's many faces including the face we see in our TVs and newspapers all the time these days. So we're going to talk about what populism is and what populism isn't. And I just thought it would be useful for us to pass, start out by calibrating what we mean when we're talking about capitalism. Here's a definition. Populism. What did I say? Populism is a political doctrine that proposes that the common people are exploited by a privileged elite and which seeks to resolve this. The underlying ideology of populists can be left, right, or center. So I'm gonna begin by asking our panelists what they think about that definition. Do, are they, do they agree with that definition? Would they like to modulate that in any way? Let's start with you, Clayton. So, so what I thought I'd do just to get us started is I have uh, four or five slides that talk ab about different definitions of populism, but also gives you some examples of populist speakers today. So you can see different styles of populist rhetoric. So um, I think a lot of people think populism is simply what's popular, you know, it's like pop cu culture or pop, pop art. That's not what we mean by populist, uh, uh, populist politics. There was a period called the populist period in the 1880s, 1890s. That's because there was a populist party. It was actually called the People's Party. We can talk about that later if you want. But populism is an idea. There's actually been lots of different scholars who've looked at this in the past, and they've come up with different explanations for what populism is. Some have argued it's a protest against unfair or rigged economic systems. Others have argued it's a fear of centralized authority, like Washington, D.C., or the EU, or the World Bank. Uh, others have argued it's anti-intellectualism. Closer? Okay. Others have argued it's about anti-intellectualism. It's a resentment of these experts telling us that they know better for us than we know for ourselves. And still others have argued it's really a, a defense of traditionalism and a nostalgia for some mythical greater past. Put it right up next to my lips, huh? Okay. So the definition I'm gonna focus on though is the one given by Michael Kazin. Michael Kazin is a terrific uh, political historian. He wrote a book, probably the definitive work on American populism called The Populist Persuasion, in which he said populism is a style of political discourse or a set of ideas about democracy which embraces a Manichaean or a dualistic view of politics. Two central ideas to populism. The first is the idea that there's an, an evil elite and different populists identify this evil elite in different ways. They can be an economic elite, a political elite, a cultural elite. And then they are opposed to a virtuous American people, yeah, oftentimes a mythical American people. Different populists identify the American people in different ways. Richard Nixon talked about the silent majority. Franklin Roosevelt talked about the forgotten man. Donald Trump's talked about real Americans. It is also, though, so it's this view of politics as a struggle between this evil elite and this virtuous American people, but it's also a moralistic view about popular sovereignty. It's the idea that the majority's will ought to be exalted and seen as virtuous, and any opposition to majority will is seen as suspect and dangerous. And that's a very important element. I'll, we'll talk about that probably later. So once we understand that, we understand that we're surrounded by populist leaders and causes today in the United States on the political left and on the political right. Political right, we have obviously Donald Trump, we have Sarah Palin, we have movements like the Tea Party movement, we have uh, right-wing militia movements. On the political left, we have people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, we have movements like the Anonymous movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement. There's also a lot of populism these days in Europe. Many of you probably know about Marine Le Pen, who just took second place in, uh, in the presidential election in France this last week. Viktor Orban, who's the uh, uh, prime minister in Hungary. Um, Nigel Farage, who led the Bre Brexit vote in U the UK. So, one question. There's all these populists who they speak to, and I think it's important for us to understand how many of us hold populist attitudes, populist views. And I don't have data for Europe, but a group of political scientists looked at this, uh, they did a major study of this uh, about in terms of, of American attitudes, 
And they tapped populism by asking questions like, do you think politics is ultimately a struggle between good and evil? Do you think politicians should nearly always follow the will of the people? Do you think a few special interests prevent us from solving most of our major problems? And do you think the people, not politicians, should make most important policy decisions? And here's what they found. The vast majority of Americans agree with all of these statements. Whoa. Americans hold deeply populist views. So that's who they're speaking to, and that's why these, these populist politicians resonate with us. Now, even though many Americans hold populist views, uh, we don't hold the same populist views. There are distinct populist styles of rhetoric in the United States today. There's a left-wing style of populism and a right-wing style of populism. And I'll just give you these examples. Is this there a centrist there, populism? Um, I, I was surprised when I reread that definition, seeing there was this, uh, they, yeah, a centrist. Perhaps. But I, I think what's important to focus on in terms of understanding different styles of populism is who do they define as the virtuous American people and who do they define as the evil elite? So on the political left, when you hear populist speakers, they talk about a political system controlled by corporate elites and Wall Street bankers. They talk about an economic system rigged against workers in favor of the wealthy, usually the 1%. And when they talk about immigrants and minorities, they talk about them as part of the exploited working class in America, oftentimes exploited by elites. So typical of this style of populism was Bernie Sanders in this last campaign. Millions of Americans are giving up on the political process. And they're giving up on the political process because they understand the economy is rigged. They are working longer hours for lower wages. They're worried about the future of their kids. And yet almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1% not what America is supposed to be about, not the fairness that we grew up believing that America was about. And then sustaining that rigged economy is a corrupt campaign finance system undermining American democracy, where billionaires, Wall Street, corporate America, can contribute unlimited sums of money into super PACs and into candidates. So you hear clearly who he thinks the evil elite are and who the exploited Americans are. On the political right, on the other hand, when you hear populists speak, they talk about a political system that is controlled by a corrupt politicians or a corrupt political establishment. This is basically an anti-government or an anti-statist form of populism. They complain that our media and our culture is controlled by liberal elites. And when they talk about immigrants and minorities, they talk about them as stealing jobs from real Americans. Typical of that right-wing style of populism was Donald Trump in his inaugural address. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. Okay, so there you hear both a left-wing style populism and a right-wing style populism, and I'll stop there and we can pick up. Now, what we're gonna hear from mostly from Cornell is the United States perspective, and what we're gonna hear from Nick Barkling and is mostly a perspective from Europe, but I wanna go back to that definition I read at the top. I'm gonna to repeat it once more to see what you agree with or what you disagree with. Populism, a political doctrine that proposes the common people are exploited by a privileged elite and it seeks to resolve this the underwriting ideology can be left, right, or center. And if you've got anything to say about centrist populists, I'd love to hear about that. What do you think about that definition? I think that works fine as, uh, as a working definition. It certainly helps us understand the kinds of dynamics that we are seeing, I think, um, on uh, both sides of the political spectrum um, in many different areas of, of the globe, in the, in the US and across Europe, which is a very, of course, diverse place politically. Um, I'm a little bit concerned, though, 
um, even if we sort of take that as our definition, I'm wondering how much um, utility it has in terms of understanding how left and right are different. Uh, different. Um, obviously, it does point us to certain similarities in terms of uh, style, in terms of rhetoric, in terms of the kind of appeals that are being made, and a certain critique of um, the dominant political economic system. Um, and for example, uh, in both the US and in many places in Europe, there's been in the last 30 years or so a kind of ideological convergence of the major parties. So in the US, both the Democrats and the Republicans have tended more towards a kind of center-right neoliberal form of governance. governance. Um, that's also true in, it, we just saw the, the French elections, for example, and you can see there the Socialist Party, right, and the conservative uh, Republican Party um, have been basically pursuing the same general policies with some differences along the edges. And that's, that sort of convergence then has allowed certain economic problems, political problems, to go unaddressed in ways that uh, broad swaths of the populace feel that their concerns are not being heard. Um, however, I think the, the various definitions that uh, Cornell took us through, particularly the way that the people is defined, is really key for making sense, right, of um, how left populism and right populism are the same and different. Yeah, tease that out for us. Who are the people in, in each case? Right. Uh, well, uh, Cornell list had a nice uh, display of several characteristics for both left and right, and I think that was, uh, that was quite accurate. Um, the, I would say that one of the key differences, though, is that um, there, when we talk about populism and the kind of pejorative um, uh, connotation that it tends to have, one of the reasons is that we worry that right people are being manipulated in some way. Um, also that it may tend to exclude certain people. And I, I think there's a real asymmetry between left and right populism in that regard. So uh, when we talk about left populism, for example, in principle, the people is inclusive of everybody. Um, to some extent, you know, with, with regard to Bernie Sanders, the, um, the central figures of the DNC suggested, um, oh, he's being angry, he's being uh, kind of belligerent against our mainstream candidates who have, for example, um, taken large sums uh, uh, in payments to make speeches for Goldman Sachs, et cetera. And they saw that as being kind of illegitimate in some ways. Um, but I, if, unless you consider you know, wealthy bankers to be like a minority, then I don't think it's really exclusive in the same sense that right-wing populism is. So clearly there's a kind of uh, more clearly defined uh, exclusion that's happening when right-wing populism defines the people. Um, and so uh, you know, it's often led kind of uh, left unsaid um, but there are certain groups, right, who are considered to be, say, not real Americans, um, undeserving, right, of the kind of uh, benefits that uh, normal citizens should be entitled to. And that's really true across many different kind of economic systems. So if you look at, you know, uh, we should talk about sort of the causes of the rise of populism. And one of the obvious ones, right, is the effects of globalization over many decades and so the feeling that, say, um, you know, the traditional industrial centers have been hollowed out, et cetera. But if you look at Europe, right, I mean, f France, which has a very generous welfare uh, state, um, the Netherlands, which is certainly not suffering economically in any major way, we are still seeing populism there. And so I would say that there's a separate underlying factor that's played into that, which is essentially uh, racism, or we could say white supremacy. Well, let me... Yeah, I'll just pick up on it a little bit. I mean, I, I, think it's, um, I think we have to be careful not to confuse populism as a historic idea and a historic mode of thinking about politics and discussing politics and the populist rhetoric we hear today. The, the distinct forms of left-wing and right-wing populism I, talk, I just gave examples of really date back to the 1930s. They emerged in the 1930s. And on the political right, you had uh, characters like Father Charles Coughlin. Uh, and on the political left, you had figures like Huey Long. Um, and then, of course, 
Franklin Roosevelt himself was a left-wing populist. You know, the, the New Deal was a popular set of programs about redistributing wealth and income to uh, working-class Americans. But prior to the 1930s, the, um, the American political discourse, uh, populist discourse was very different. So if you went back and you talked about some of the famous populists from the populist era, uh, people like William Jennings Bryant or Tom Watson, uh, Today, I suppose many of us would consider them left-wing populists in the sense they wanted to redistribute income and wealth to working-class Americans. They were against bankers. They were against Wall Street uh, uh, banks and, and corp big corporations. But they were deeply, deeply racist. Uh, Tom Watson was extremely racist. Uh, in fact, said that the only real Americans are white Americans. And he specifically said, you know, use all sorts of racial slurs. Blacks and Asians and others were not real Americans and shouldn't be part of of, 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 of uh, American programs. Um, if you go back you know, even further than that, the populist in the 1850s, the Know Nothing movement, deeply populist movement, very, very nativist, very uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic in particular. Uh, if you go back before that, Andrew Jackson, one of our populist presidents, also deeply, deeply racist. So, but I, I, in my mind, you, we need to separate out um, other strands of political discourse, racism, nativism, authoritarianism, from populism. Because you can be a populist and not a racist. You can be a populist and not an authoritarian. You can be a populist and not a nativist. Um, and, and, and so these are really separate things that are going on. And sometimes they get combined and sometimes they don't. So, and in fact, one of the points I would make is, you know, some of our great presidents have been populist presidents. Thomas Jefferson was a populist. Franklin Roosevelt was a populist. Ronald Reagan was a populist. But um, when populism becomes dangerous is when it gets tied with some of these other anti-democratic ideas like racism, nativism, and authoritarianism. Uh, That's when we need to get concerned. Yeah, I'd like to get you to tease that out a little bit also. Like, could you give an example of a populist movement that succeeded in resolving this exploitation of the common people by the privileged elite? It worked. And yeah. maybe an example, a counterexample of populism run amok. Well, the New Deal. The New Deal is a classic example of, of a set of populist programs and policies. Uh, Fra you know, Franklin Roosevelt, in fact, it, you know, I have this great cartoon that depicts Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, shaking hands with the forgotten man. He was seen as the patron saint of working class Americans. He, uh, in one of his most famous campaign speeches, uh, called I Welcome Their Hatred. He says, you know, the real enemies of the American people are big bankers, big corporations, and they're united in their hatred against me, and I welcome their hatred. Um, that, that was a, a very, very popular speech. He was a very populist president, and he um, affected a lot of populist programs. And some would argue very, you know, they really did address the, the needs of the working class. So. So populists, um, again, have been a very powerful, positive force in our history in the past. How about a failed populist movement, a failed populist leader who came in saying they were going to give power from the elites back to the, the common people and, and really failed at that effort? Well, um, the populist party, the People's Party, obviously failed. William Jennings Bryant never got elected. Um, uh, I mean, I, I would go back and, and say, if you look at, for instance, the Know Nothing Party, they actually nominated Millard Fillmore as their presidential candidate in 1856. He got 20% of the vote. Um, but again, a deeply nativist and, and racist organization, but very populist. Um, I mean, I mean, there's lots of examples of populists who've never been elected. <laughs> so, sure. so Huey Long was a populist who never got elected. Father Co Charles Coughlin was a populist who never got elected. Was Huey Long a successful populist? Well, he was successful in the sense, I mean, I have this great clip. You guys want to hear a clip of Huey Long? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America, and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat? The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. How are you going to feed the balance of the people? 
What's Morgan and Baruch and Rockefeller and Mellon gonna do with all that grub? They can't eat it. They can't wear the clothes. They can't live in the house. Give them a yacht. Give them a palace. Send them to Reno and give them a new wife when they want it. That's what they want. But when they've got everything on the God's living earth that they can eat and they can wear and they can live in, and all that their children can live in and wear and eat and all their children's children can use, then we got to call Mr. Morgan and Mr. Mellon and Mr. Rockefeller back and say, come back here. Put that stuff back on this table here that you took away from here that you don't need. Leave something else for the American people to consume. Then... We start from the bottom, that the 25 or more million American families shall have a homestead, a home, and the comforts of a home, including an automobile and a radio, the things it takes in that house to live on. We say to America, 125 million, None shall be too big, none shall be too poor. So his, his platform was actually called the Share Our Wealth Platform. He proposed capping Americans' income and wealth so uh, American families could earn up to a million dollars and hold up to five million dollars in assets, then after that all of it would be taxed away and redistributed, was his, was his platform. And as I understand it, a fairly successful governor in Louisiana assassinated before he could run for political office exactly. at a higher level, but really put a scare into Roosevelt. He did. He was, uh, he was both a governor and then a senator from Louisiana. He was going to challenge Roosevelt. Roosevelt was very worried about him, and he would have been a potent challenger for the nomination, Democratic nomination. Nick, let me put that question to you about like successful populist examples from Europe and unsuccessful examples. What comes to mind? Well, there are a couple of uh, examples which I think are still unfolding today. Um, certainly the uh, crisis over the, over the euro has um, generated um, populist movements both left and right uh, in Europe. And so um, this is where, again, maybe the term populism is useful because it shows how, uh, for example, left-wing parties that are uh, Euroskeptic um, find some commonality with, uh, with right-wing uh, parties that are also skeptical of, of the euro and its effects. And so, for example, in, in southern Europe, in Greece and, um, and in Spain, where uh, you know, they, they've, they've done quite poorly in comparison to northern and western Europe uh, under globalization, um, and particularly feel themselves to have kind of suffered under the yoke of the centralized administration of the EU and its related institutions, uh, there has been uh, left-wing populist uh, backlash there. Uh, so in Greece, uh, Syriza, and in Spain, Podemos, and um, you know, they, uh, Syriza was act is, uh, uh, actually has uh, b managed to exercise some power. I think both parties are kind of struggling with how to actually manage that and to actually uh, go up against the overwhelming power of uh, of, of the EU institutions and especially, of course, Germany being the, the dominant um, power. Um, I can think of another um, uh, example which is um, more distressing, I think. Um, I, I do think, you know, historically, um, it, because populism is not a very precise term, it's, it's, it's designed to be vague in some ways, it's a little bit hard to, to identify populist movements, in my opinion, but uh, if we look at the case of Germany, for example, um, in the Weimar Republic, which is uh, the um, uh, democratic republic that existed immediately after World War I, uh, prior to the rise of the, of the Nazis who came into power in 1933, um, there was, a, you could see that as a kind of populist uh, mobilization. So the, the Nazi party, um, you know, trying to mobilize uh, what, in, what in German called it the, the Mittelstand, the sort of middling, middle class uh, people, so not, uh, and so sort of like the small shopkeepers, um, not necessarily the working class, right? So it was framed, uh, despite the term national socialist, specifically an anti-Marxist, anti-class kind of mobilization, right? So 
there it was, right, dust folk, the people, right, against the su supposed international elite uh, of bankers um, uh, and, and, of course, Jews in particular. Now, um, that, of course, is a, a, a story of success in a way that's not very, um, uh, not a very happy story. It, it carries on, I think, also in the kind of resonance that that term has, right? And so this is, again, where I want to kind of make this distinction in terms of left and right wing populism. Um, das Volk is a term which means literally the people, but of course, because of the Nazis, has a kind of racist uh, tinge. It means, right, this, the Aryan people defined kind of biologically um, Jews being a potential uh, pollutant on the kind of strength of that race, of that people. Um, it, it, that term has managed to succeed. So um, interestingly, in the uh, protests against East Germany in uh, late 1989 into 1990, in Leipzig, there were these spontaneous demonstrations. People might know about this where uh, tens of thousands of people uh, came and, and started chanting, Wir sind das Volk. Uh, we are the people. And so there, you know, the emphasis was on uh, it is a kind of populist moment, I think. It is saying we, the people, right, uh, in a supposedly democratic society should be the source of sovereignty, right? And so they're seeing the regime as being these elites who are exploiting them. And uh, that is perhaps a more happy story, but this very same slogan, unfortunately, has been taken up again, first by uh, PEGIDA, which is an acronym for people against uh, patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West, uh, very um, you know, explicitly racist anti-Islamic uh, uh, um, uh, group. And then this slogan has also gone into now the alternative for Germany uh, right-wing populist party. So that, you know, that term sort of carries that uh, ambiguity, the dust folk, and you can really see it in the German case, I think. Uh, who, who is defined as uh, the people, and whether we want that to be successful or not, I think um, it's more than just sort of a formal question about the style of politics, but really how, um, how is that people being defined, and what are the risks entailed? What causes populism to wax or populism to wane? What, what brings it on? You, one might think right off the bat if elitists had more power in society and there was more of a division in society, that might give rise to more populism. Is that true, or are there other causes of bringing it to the forefront? And are there c historic conditions that lead to the populism fading for some reason, or is, is there always going to be a populist? What do you think, Cornell? So, um, well, so I, so I, I give a lecture on uh, populism and paranoia in American politics, and when I give that, I, I argue uh, the first thing to understand about populism, I, I say populism is for losers. And what I mean by that is populism is an explanation for why certain people feel like they are coming out on the losing end of major cultural, uh, social, demographic, and economic changes. So, uh, th you know, th it's not surprising that we had populism really rampant in the United States in the 1880s and 1890s when we were going through the Industrial Revolution. We were moving from an agricultural-based economy to an industrial one becoming more urbanized. We had massive waves of immigration. And the upshot of that was, this is, uh oh, someone's, <laughs> someone's going through my, my slides. The upshot of that was that um, there were real winners and losers in the economy. There were some people like the, the Rockefellers and, uh, uh, and the Morgans and others who were living lives of ap absolute opulence. There were, the vast majority of Americans were living d in Dickensian conditions in the inner cities, working very, very long hours for very, very poor wages and poor working conditions. And populism sp spoke to them. When a populist like um, William Jennings Bryant got up and said, the problem is it's these big corporations, it's these crooked bankers, they're the ones exploiting you, and so vote for me and we'll take care of that. That spoke to them, it resonated with them. Now today, if you look at what's going on, we're going th through the second Gilded Age. It's the new Gilded Age. We have a new economy that has moved from a national economy to a global economy. Um, we've increasingly automated and mechanized the manufacturing process. 
And what that has produced is a bifurcated economy. Some Americans are doing extremely well in this new economy. If you're in the top 20% of families, your median income has skyrocketed over the last 30 to 40 years. And if you're in the top 1%, it's off the charts. Mm -hmm. If you're in the bottom 80%, your income, your mean income for those families has either been stagnant or it has fallen during this period. And what that means, there's millions and millions of Americans who are working longer and longer hours for less and less. They can't afford to send their kids to college. They can't afford their mortgages. They can't afford health care. And they're looking for explanations for what's going on. So, they, so they, an explanation is elitists are doing this to you. Is that the yeah. explanation? Is that the real explanation? Or is it just a form of rhetoric that's used by politicians yeah. to get elected? So, so the explanation that populists give, um, and again, you get a left wing and a right wing response to this. So the right wing populist says, well, the problem are these crooked politicians who've done these crooked trade deals. You know, it's basically this was Donald Trump's campaign. It's all these bad trade deals. It's NAFTA. And we're going to do away with that. And it's also the fact that we let all these immigrants in coming and taking your jobs. So if we build a wall, we get rid of these trade deals, all these blue collar jobs are going to come back and your lives are going to be better. Uh, Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, says, you know, the real problem is we have all these CEOs and Wall Street bankers who are taking all the profits for themselves and they're not sharing them with the workers. And so if you vote for me, I'm going to raise their taxes, we'll redistribute the income and wealth, and you all have free education. And so that will solve the problem. So now, now so, so that's their explanation. Is this, are either of these going to work? No, and let me explain why they're not going to work. This is why these explanations aren't going to work. So that red line there is manufacturing output in the United States since 1950. The blue line is manufacturing jobs in the United States. We are manufacturing more in this country than we've ever manufactured. We're manufacturing more in this country than we can ever consume in this country. And yet, we are an all-time low for manufacturing jobs. We're not shipping jobs overseas. In fact, there was just a major study that came out last week that estimated that job loss as a result of international trade is less than 150,000 jobs a year, net jobs a year over the last 10 years. Now, to put that in perspective, we, we uh, create 200,000 new jobs a month over the last six years. Trade deals are not going to bring back these jobs. Go to, any, go to any factory, go to Boeing, and what you'll find are thousands of robots doing the jobs that blue-collar workers used to do. Those jobs aren't coming back, and in fact, it's, it's going to get worse. You know, within a decade, we're going to have self-driving cars and buses. You know, all your truck drivers, your bus drivers, your taxi drivers, they're not going to have jobs. Now, this is a good thing, by the way. It means we can produce more wealth with less labor than ever before. The question is, how do we redistribute the wealth that we're producing. But that's a different question than trade or taxing CEOs. Nick, what about when you look at Europe, or what conditions kind of lead to the rise of populism? And are the conditions that lead to populism waning when it comes to politics? I think, and actually to connect this back to uh, what Cornell was just saying about the, the US, I think Clearly, this is you know the, the larger backdrop to this whole phenomenon, right? Is uh, the problem right of the capitalist economy being unable to, uh, at least in the way that it's configured, actually right sustain people's livelihoods on a on a mass scale? Um, I would point out, you know, one of the stories that's been uh, told to us about, say, the rise of Trump as a populist, you know, when he says that you know, the, the elites have uh, sold your jobs down the river. Um, you know, much of the blame has been placed on the, the so-called white working class. But if you look at um, the, you know, during the Republican primary, the average um, Trump supporter, uh, their, their average income was $72,000 per year. So there's something a little bit funny going on, I think, about that very, uh, in some ways, understandable narrative about um, how say, economic decline has contributed to, uh, to the rise of populism. That's certainly one part of it. I think that also does hold true in, in much of Europe. Uh, looking at the French elections recently, um, I, I saw one uh, quote from a Le Pen supporter who used to vote socialist, um, and he said, the left isn't even the left anymore, they're for globalization and capitalism. 
So there, there is this kind of sense, right, that, again, there's been this ideological convergence of, of the mainstream left and right parties, and that they don't have any compelling answer for uh, this problem. But I think, um, you know, the, the statistic I, I said about the average uh, Trump primary supporter uh, is indicative that it's not just about economic decline, although the, the pain is clearly real, right? And I think anyone in this room can, can understand that. Um, but there's also, I think, um, in relation to populism, it's not just about the objective economics, but also the kind of sense of cultural uh, status and prominence being lost. Um, and, um, and we see that, that that also sort of extends, right, the roots of populism beyond just the kind of economic... It's interesting. Uh, so the reality of the economics, and then there's overla overlayering that is... This, this cultural tension that's going on. I think so, and that, that also does connect to much longer traditions, right, in, uh, in, in European history, which are quite uh, dark. Um, I, I, I wanted to read one other um, quotation which sort of connects also um, Trump-style populism to s some of the, the, the kinds that we're seeing in Europe. Um, some of you may, may have seen this as a very controversial uh, tweet from Steve King, who's a congressman from Iowa, this was, um, I think, March 12th, so right before the parliamentary uh, elections in the Netherlands on March 15th. And, and so he tweeted, um, Geert Wilders, who is the, he's the main right-wing populist in the Netherlands, Wilders understands that culture and demographics are our destiny. We can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. So this is, um, you know, there's... Uh, that's, that goes beyond merely just economic uh, pain, right? Which is something that we've seen, uh, you know, has been spread out over many decades now, since really the rise of neoliberalism since the 1970s. So the fact that we're suddenly seeing, you know, this, this global kind of wave where somebody like Steve King is drawing a connection, right, to the supposed, you know, decline of... Um, uh, of our civilization in Europe and the U.S. goes beyond just economic questions. Yeah, let me let me jump in there because the same thing's going on in the United States. So, so I, you know, again, when I said that populism is for losers, it's explanations for why certain groups feel like they're coming out of the losing end of, of of changes in the economy, changes in our culture, changes in demographics. We have more foreign-born Americans today than any time since the turn of the last century. Now. We know immigrants bring dynamism to the culture and to the economy, but they also raise deep issues about national identity. And there are no doubt many Americans are, feel threatened by this. They feel like they are becoming a minority in their own country. And in fact, they are. Within a, two decades, we will be a minority majority in the United States. Now, again, for people who feel threatened by that, this populist rhetoric that says, you know, the problem is we have these greedy CEOs who want to bring in cheap labor from Mexico. That's the problem. We've got to keep them out. Or you have populists, on the other hand, who say, you know, the, the problem is uh, we have these corrupt politicians who want to bring in minorities so, to, so they'll vote for them in their electoral coalitions. That's the problem. We'll keep them out. This is appealing to people who feel threatened by these demographic shifts that are taking place. So... So economic changes, demographic changes, social and cultural changes as well. There's a great book out there right now by a sociologist entitled Strangers in Their Own Land, really talking about the Tea Party movement. But it's really, uh, it, it, it's an explanation this, the, you know, that there's this cultural elite who's foisting upon Americans this uh, culture that is ex more accepting of certain groups like gays and lesbians, that, sees less of a role for religion in our public institutions, that sees uh, you know, things like the changing gender relationships is a good thing. There are many Americans who feel threatened by this, and they feel like they're strangers in their own land, and so when you have a populist say, well, these are these liberal elites voicing this artificial culture on the real Americans, this resonates with them. Great book, Arlie Hochschild. You can listen to my interview with her at KUOW.org. <laughs> um, it seems as though populism excuse the expression, is kind of an untrumpable thing to put out there. Because if you say you're in favor of the people versus the elites, how does one answer that? You can't, an elite party isn't going to win against that argument. Like what are the counter, like what's the opposite of populism or what defeats populism? Well, I'm, I, again, I'm not sure 
um, defeating populism is necessarily the goal. I mean, there are times when uh, our established institutions, our elite institutions, are very problematic. I mean, there's, there's no question there's a lot of economic inequality and unfairness in our society today, and populists speak to that, and rightly so, right? So, so I'm not sure defeating populism is the right thing. I, I think, again, my view is the danger with populism is when populists also embrace other undemocratic ideas, ideas like authoritarianism, racism, nativism, uh, bigotry. And the reason this becomes so dangerous is because it gives these other ideas a sheen of democratic um, legitimacy. It is, it's, these ideas now get equated with the will of the majority and opposition to them is seen as illegitimate. And I think that's the real danger of populist leaders is when they embrace these other undemocratic ideas. And that's what we gotta be on, on our guard against. Now, now there is a, a tension between populism because it embraces this Manichaean view uh, and embraces a particular view about popular sovereignty. There's a tension between that and democratic pluralism. Democratic pluralism is the idea that, that not only should there be disagreements in a democracy, it, or not only these different viewpoints inevitable in democracy, it's healthy for a democracy to have them. And so what you want to do in a pluralist democracy is protect minorities, protect minor minority viewpoints and mo minority rights, protect them against the majority. And that's, that's the tension. So, so I, I mean, I, again, in my view, when a populist starts wanting to attack minority groups, wants to start suppressing minority viewpoints, that's when we got to become worried. Well, and of course, Minorities or immigrants are not the ruling class. They're not the elite by any means. So it seems to conflate two different things. But if you succeed to, in convincing people that it's a populist stance, one seems to overwhelm the other. Like, what do you think about it when it comes to, like, what, what's the opposite argument? Uh, can you argue against populism, or is that always going to trump anything? Well, I agree with Cornell that I'm not entirely sure that it's it's always bad either. I mean, I. Uh, Again, I see right populism and left populism as being categorically different in some way. I, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced that Bernie is a populist in the sense of having uh, a, a Manichaean viewpoint in that way. Yes, he's criticizing the bankers, et cetera, um, but not just in moralistic terms, in terms of actual economic um, challenges right, that this country is facing. Um, I'm not sure that he is an anti-pluralist. Clearly, you know, there's always been a problem on the left, of course, of how to deal with right, building a coalition of people who have different struggles and different interests. But I, I don't really see where left-wing populist movements are really trying to um, get rid of all plurality in, in that way. Um, it seems to me, in terms of sort of answering, say, the problem of, of right-wing populism, um, somehow the left is going to have to figure out some more compelling answer than just um, you know, catering ever more to this mythical center right, which is what the Democrats are currently doing. They're you know, not trying to build a new base. They're not trying to build new coalitions. Instead, they're in search. Uh, now they're sort of saying, well, you can be sure you can be a pro-life uh, Democrat. Yes, let's. And so they're sort of catering more and more to the right. And you see that also... Um, in, in Europe as well. So now we have um, you know, the new president of France, Emmanuel Macron. Um, he is this you know, sort, of, sort of centrist technocrat, and people are saying, whew, uh, Le Pen didn't win. Thank goodness we, we, you know, we stem the tide of populism. I am not convinced that he has really a compelling answer to the kind of discontent that she voices. And so I think that is a real open question for the next... Uh, five years, the more and more we keep seeing kind of the same centrist uh, response to these very real problems, the more we're going to see the same uh, result, I'm afraid. I want to go to your questions now. We have a microphone in back, and uh, you could just line up at the microphone and we'll get to them. While people are lining up, I, 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 you said that maybe there could be a centrist populist, but in this whole discussion, we've always been talking about them either on the left or on the right as we've been speaking, does, any, does a centrist populist come to mind? Is there such a thing? I'm just, I think it's, I can't imagine one myself. Well, I, well again, you know, po all popul uh, the way I think about populism and the way, you know, that um, 
Michael Kazin discusses it. It's, it's really a, it's a, it's a way of thinking and it's a style of discourse about politics that simply sees politics as a struggle between an evil elite and a virtuous people out there, right? So, so in, in that sense, um, I mean, I'm, again, there are times when that view um, may be right. <laughs> there are other times when that view is not right. You know, sometimes, so uh, Walter Burns, who was a, a political theorist in the 1960s, had this great quote, he said, he said, the question in all democracies is not whether we'll be governed by elites. The question is which elites. Hmm. And that's absolutely true. Look, Donald Trump became an elite as soon as he became elected. If Bernie Sanders had been elected, he would have become an elite. He's, and so Burns says, you know, the real trick for democracies is to make sure we're governed by worthy elites. It, it's not to be fearful of elites. Everyone who has political power is an elite. So the real question is, what is a worthy elite and what's not a worthy elite? And, and that's what we should be focused on, it seems to me. Okay, let's go to the question. What's your name and what's your concise, um, precise Jack question? Jack Mackey, a very simple question, which I expect will be a com complex answer. How, what is the role of religion? How does religion play a role in populist movements? Religion and populist movements. Religion often in society has represented elites. Mm. In the past, it's also represented downtrodden people. It seems like it could be in either direction. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I mean, it's certainly there have been, um, in American history, there have been periods when uh, religious bigotry has been hooked up with, with populist ideas. So again, if you go back to the, for instance, the Know Nothing movement in the 1850s, it was, dan uh, it was very populist, it was very anti-immigrant but anti-Catholic immigrant. They saw Catholics as, as trying to undermine American democracy and, and Christianity itself. Um, and it led to actually uh, riots, anti-Catholic riots in places like uh, um, Philadelphia and uh, Baltimore where Catholics were beat up and killed in the streets. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly been periods when, when you went to the populist era, for instance, one of the, the big uh, scandals that the populists saw was the so-called gold uh, standard, the gold conspiracy, which they thought was a conspiracy of international Jewish bankers to exploit working class Americans. And it was, you know, deeply anti-Semitic, uh, a, a lot of the, the populists of the 1890s. So, I mean, there have been periods when religious minorities have been picked on as, as um, particularly problematic uh, by populist uh, officials. And sometimes they're hooked up with the elites like Jewish bankers are. They're seen as part of the elite structure that's oppressing Americans. Sometimes they're simply seen as scapegoats for why working class Americans aren't doing well, as in the case of Catholic immigrants, for instance. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's hard to generalize uh, on that question. Um, c certainly in the European case, there's so many, there's so much diversity in terms of how religion intersects with politics. Uh, you know, Le Pen does represent this kind of uh, longer conservative uh, Catholic tradition in France. Um, in the Netherlands, it's not clear to me that religion plays all that much of a role, say, in the Wilders campaign. I mean, it sort of represents a more like uh, secular, supposedly progressive humanism. Um, you could say that um, in some places, I think in, in Hungary and maybe some other places, uh, insofar as religion can be racialized, that is to say that, you know, as, as Cornell was saying, you know, that when, when Jews are, are seen as these sort of outsiders who are, are you know, running this kind of conspiracy, um, you can see a, a similar kind of thing happening with, uh, with Muslims, I think, uh, where it's not so much uh, that people object to, say, the tenets of the Quran, well, that, that is what, uh, you know, Vildas were saying. Clearly, there's a kind of racial dimension uh, to that. So I think it would be hard to separate purely in terms of uh, religious identity, but perhaps in the sense that, you know, under the surface, there's it, it, tied to white supremacy is a certain um, Christian identification that sees, you know, is non-pluralistic, right? That sees uh, as Jews and Muslims and, and other people as um, not one of the people. What's your name and what's your question? 
My name is Mike, and um, uh, the word conspiracy was missing from your presentation. Might you consider the possibility that what we've seen in the recent elections was not a confrontation of ideas, but rather a conspiracy? You've ignored the fact that we have Fox News and we've had um, uh, the uh, domination of the media by right-wing sources. And we've seen a one party, the Democratic Party, lose six, three consecutive elections because they were trying to bring a populist concept, namely universal health care, and they've been punished in 2010, 12, 14, 16, and so forth. So why don't you talk about the fact that we're not confronting two ideas, but we are in, there's been a conspiracy that has taken over the country. Is it a conspiracy? Uh, the, the other part of it is, it has to do with the media and the way that the media flogs or encourages populism or would you like to take up either of those themes? Well, I, I You've got a lot to say about conspiracies, <laughs> I, I do. know that. I have, a, I have a lecture I do on conspiracy theories and, and paranoia. Um, and uh, Richard Hostetter, another great American uh, political historian, wrote a terrific book in the 1960s entitled The Paranoid Style of American Politics, in which he traces what he calls the paranoid style of discourse, belief in conspiracy theories and seeing secretive forces at work in our politics all the time back to the very beginning of our country, and it's been a very powerful force as well in, in American political history. And by the way, the data, and I, I could show you this, but, but there's the data on who believes conspiracy theories. By the way, the majority of Americans, more than 50% of all Americans believe one or more conspiracy theories. And not only that, but the, about half of Americans hold what, what scholars of, of conspiracy theories <laughs> call a paranoid predisposition. They hold attitudes that predispose us to believe in conspiracy theories. And that paranoid predisposition cuts across the political spectrum. Liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans are equally likely to believe or to have this paranoid predisposition. So just take the two most popular conspiracy theories out there right now. The truth or conspiracy theory that, that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. And the, or, or the sorry, the birther conspiracy uh, that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, and the truth or conspiracy that the Bush administration was complicit in the 9-11 attacks. About 36% of Americans believe both of these conspiracy theories, equal numbers. Now, it just so happens the vast majority of those who believe in the Obama conspiracy theory are Republicans. The vast majority who believe in the Bush administration conspiracy theory are Democrats. And this is the same with, with almost all of our conspiracy theories. So if you take, for instance, Global warming, do you think it's a hoax? Well, 36% of Americans believe that as well, but only about 15% of Democrats do, whereas about 86% of Republicans do, right? So you can go down the list, and our pre-existing political identities, our ideological and our partisan identities, shape which conspiracy theories we believe. And, but I think it's, it's important to point out that many Americans have a view of politics that's not only Manichaean, that we see as a struggle between the forces of good and evil, but we also have a paranoid predisposition in the sense we're predisposed to believe there are secretive forces at play and at work. And, and I think that's on both the left and the right. Now, look, I'm not making a comment about is there, you know, was there collusion with the Russians and the Trump administration? I mean, I, I, this, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, cast doubt on any we'll of those We'll have a special theories. prosecutor a little bit later to talk to that. I, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. Yeah. But, but I think it, it is true that both on the left and the right, we see conspiracies when they're there and when they're not there. Do you want to add to that? I mean, I, I think the other part of that question, right, had to do with the media yeah. in, in all of this. And I think that is an important component that, you know, we don't even uh, need to look to conspiracies to, to make sense of uh, what we're seeing today. Um, you know the the evidence is, is, is that's in, right in front of us is is enough to be become angry uh, about without having to uh, to make recourse to those kinds of theories. So you know when you know Bernie Sanders is railing against 
bankers and so forth, um, you know, it, it doesn't really require that there is some kind of secret cabal of people who are plotting you know, to uh, oppress the rest of America. You can just look at the uh, statistics and you can look at the declared policies of <laughs> the Republican Party. And people, even if they're sort of, do have this disposition, I think, there is a certain point at which reality sets in as well. And I think we see that also with, you know, with the response to the Republican um, uh, plan to get rid of uh, the Affordable Care Act, right, is that, you know, there was, this, we can see this element of conspiracy there, you know, keep your hands off my Medicare, um, people not understanding that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing, and, you know, demonizing Obamacare, of course. Um, but once, you know, it gets through to people that, hey, these people right here at this town hall are trying to take away my health insurance and I need it or I'm going to die, um, you know, reality hopefully cuts in in a certain way. Unfortunately, it's a, of course, but the media is a much bigger um, uh, problem. Yes, what's your name and what's your short, concise question? Hi, I'm Ashwin Budden. My question is, do you really feel that uh, Trump is a populist at heart? Um, I, would, I, would, I would just say, I ask that because I would argue that he is in fact not and in some way came to the, through the campaign in a sort of self-serving manner and I won't go into all the sort of articles that have come out about his sort of narcissistic well, tendencies, but like ask, the question is, do you feel that he has kind of co-opted uh, populism or there have been forces around him who have sort of enforced the populist message that he has co-opted? Yeah, I think it's beyond our panel to know what's in Donald Trump's heart, but, <laughs> but they may be able to comment on whether he might be using the rhetoric of populism, have used it in the campaign and still be using it. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> Um, I mean, my own sense of Donald Trump is he's a narcissist, and so he's willing to say whatever will advance what he thinks is his own interests. I do think he is surrounded by many, uh, like Steve Bannon and others, who are real populists, who really believe uh, their, the populist message that they embrace. Um, again, I think Bernie Sanders is a populist who really believes in his populist message, that, they're, uh, that the real Americans are, are being hurt by an economic elite, and, and we need to do something about that. So there are real populists out there in our politics today. I'm not sure Donald Trump is one or not, but I don't know. So. Well, he certainly, he talked about draining the swamp a lot, but when you look at the amount of money and many of the people he's appointed to posts, it doesn't appear as though he's turned it that way at all. Do you want to add to yeah, that? I think that's totally correct. If you look at the you know, net wealth of his cabinet is astronomical. He is, um, you know, the, despite all of his missteps, um, you know, the mainstream Republicans have supported him to this point because he's helping push their agenda, right? Um, I think... You know, it, it's hard to know what's in its heart. It's hard to even know what he even thinks. I'm not sure we can say that there is. Well, it's hard it, to know what he even says. In all seriousness, after he says it. Um, there's. So, well, I mean, what what is the Trump doctrine exactly? Yes, he talked about draining the the swamp, uh, et cetera. But it's the policies seem to amount to right cutting taxes and a sort of traditional agenda. Um, but I think, again, the question, is he a populist or not, it hinges again on how do we define the people. I, I pulled aside one other quotation. I'm not sure exactly where this is from, but he at one point said, the only important thing is the unification of the people because the other people don't mean anything. <laughs> so now, okay, so everyone laughed because that sounds like typical kind of non sequitur you know, incoherence, but I think actually, if you take it at its face value, this sort of shows, you know, what, what do we mean by the people, right? He is implicitly saying there are real Americans and there are other people. And so his populism doesn't have to speak to, you know, the masses necessarily or the people whose economic interests he's claiming to represent. He is speaking, you know, sometimes with dog whistles, sometimes quite explicitly, right, to a certain kind of real American, and that does not uh, include all Americans. I think what is clear, um, regardless of what Donald Trump thinks or believes, is his rhetoric is deeply populist. If you can't listen to his inaugural address and not hear populism and nationalism in that, both, but populism. 
and you know this statement you know that, that you're going to you, you'll be forgotten no longer i am going to be your voice that is that is what populists say that's populist rhetoric so so he is clearly populist in the sense he's engaging in a populist style of political discourse and rhetoric and whether he believes it or not you know nobody knows yes uh, your name and your short question hi i'm, I'm richard myers um I get the populist left and right, you explain that, and especially the differences for the what is real American. And then, my, so my question has to do with historically as well as currently, it's clear on how they address the what is real American, either immigration policy, how do you uh, keep non-real Americans out. What my question again is, historically, how do populists, what have they floated legislatively or otherwise to redistribute wealth? What that's they both you you went on where both the left and right attack that it's either the the corporate America or the politicians are the bad people in terms of distributing that wealth and on a basic level. But what is the right. what are the proposals? Even you know you go through Bernie, you get through Trump. What would they actually propose that would be like real to actually distribute wealth? Are there authentic proposals? Historically, or have programs? there been have those long ago? Did they yes. float ideas out? Well, every man a king. Yui Long, we talked about. Yeah. But are there other examples historically of where they've actually delivered on this redistribution of wealth from the elites to the have-nots? Well, well, again, every era. Again, I, you know, again, from my perspective, the populist rhetoric is a is an explanation for why certain people are losing out on major changes taking place in the economy, in our culture, our society different periods, you have different challenges. So for instance, during the 1890s, um, you know, the populists were attacking the gold standard. They thought the gold standard was the mechanism used by the wealthy to keep workers um, in debt and, and to exploit them. And so they had this elaborate theory that it was a, a bunch of international Jewish bankers that imposed the gold standard on us, and they wanted bimetallism, and that was one of their pr the primary planks of their platform. You know, Huey Long, you know, wanted to share our wealth. He wanted to limit American income and, and wealth and then re redistribute all the rest. Franklin Roosevelt, a populist, had New Deal programs and policies that put in place a social safety net uh, to help American, uh, working class Americans. Um, so different populists proposed different things. Bernie Sanders has proposed a lot of populist programs, for instance, the idea of free higher education, the idea of a single-payer health care system, and, and, uh, and basically making health care a right for all Americans, meaning that they'd be paid for, for all Americans. So he's proposed a lot of populist ideas. Now, again, Donald Trump has proposed populist ideas. They're different, as populist ideas are things like we're going to get tough on trade and we're going to have a, a, a national industrial policy that will bring these blue-collar jobs back. Now, I don't think that's going to work, but that is addressing the plight of working class Americans. They see these jobs have gone overseas. And he's gonna build a wall and keep um, uh, low page immigrant labor out. And that will drive up wages for working class Americans is his argument. Now that's a populist argument. Now, is it gonna work? No, I don't think so. But that is populist arguments and, and, and policies. I guess, does that answer your question? Yes, but I guess I, I, my key adjective was whether they're real or not. I mean. Well, his or in the, in the past, you were, you were saying yeah, right. I, and historically I, and are people who delivered on this promise of redistribution right. and of wealth. Right, legislatively, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have health care, one thing to have free education, but when 1% have all the wealth, there's an appeal to redistribute that, but how would they actually attack that so that was redistributed? I mean, yeah. other than, you know, that, so there seems to be like an appeal to the popular ideas to grab and navigate to. But or, who's really delivered on them? But Are there I any examples from that. Europe that would apply here? I mean, actually, what I was thinking about a little bit earlier is not so much policies that have been carried out and delivered on, but uh, one of the issues when we're talking about Euroscepticism, you know, I mentioned that there are left and right wing parties in Europe, right, who are critical of the role of the EU uh, for different reasons, right? So, you know, on the right, it tends to be. Um, you know, a dislike of the kind of centralized authority, especially uh, in relationship to immigration. Um, on the left, it, part of the frustration is that the, the Troika 
um, has um, really restricted the ability of national governments to develop their own um, monetary policies. So the, you know, when you're a national politician and you can't rely on the traditional Keynesian mechanisms that you had before, you're, you're really um, hamstrung. And so that's been part of the populist uh, reaction in, say, Greece, right, is that um, they're, very, they're very frustrated because um, you know, they are constantly having to repay uh, pay back uh, loans and they feel like they can't break out of that cycle. They can't use their own sort of policy uh, domestically to try and generate their own um, economies. Hi, what's your name and what's your brief question? Hi there, my name is Jimmy Avery. My question concerns something you brought up earlier in the evening about automation. Uh, because so many jobs are getting automated these days and folks are making less money, they have less work to do. Uh, to avoid a populist uprising, what do you think are all the various options? to deal with that situation because I feel it's the political issue of the 21st century, the political issue that under underlies everything else. So including wealth dis redistribution, uh, equity sharing, what do you think are all the options? From a populist perspective? Sure. Okay. <laughs> what are the real options? You pointed out some options you said were false yeah, options. Yeah, well I agree with you. Again, if you go back to this chart, I mean, the real problem for working class Americans, and the reason why you've seen this tremendous polarization of income and wealth, so this is different quintiles of Americans' mean income. So that top line is the top 20% of families in the United States. Uh, their mean income has gone up dramatically. And if you look at the top 1%, it's skyrocketed. But the bottom 80% has been vir virtually flat during this time. And this is the Gini index of inequality measure in the United States. You can see inequalities growing. What's causing this is not trade. What's causing that is this. That's where these blue collar jobs have gone. So they've gone to, to automation. And it's, and it's going to continue to go to automation. And again, we see, some of us think of this as a bad thing. That means, you know, we don't have as many high paying blue collar jobs. This is a great problem to have. We can produce more wealth now than ever with less labor, and what it means is all of us should be spending more time doing things like artistic pursuits, recreational pursuits, creative pursuits. What the, the problem we gotta grapple with is the one you mentioned. What do we do with an economy structurally that doesn't need to have everybody employed? Or at least not everybody employed at wages that they can live on. How do you then deal with questions like how do you pay for health care for all? How do you pay for housing for all? How do you guarantee an income for all? And that's the debate we ought to be having. We shouldn't be having a debate about trade policies so much, or even taxing CEOs, even though these are real issues that we ought to address, but they are minuscule compared to the structural changes that have taken place in our economy. Well, guaranteed income, one, um Bernie Sanders' education policy, like let's get, allow more people to go to college to get the skills they need to leverage themselves into better positions. Any other thoughts on what would Yeah, I, I think you know, the basic income idea is one that's gaining some traction. It has been um, actually, um, I can't really think of specific examples, but has been implemented in some places, I think, and they're doing, sorry? Finland. Finland. So um, you know, there are uh, places also in com combination with Right, a different um, uh, tax structure compared to what we have here, which is very regressive. Right, I think there. I think Cornell is right that there are, are uh, some imminent possibilities there that we should be able to develop. Uh, that's the socialist dream, right? Um, but let's look at what you know. What is the, uh, the current tendency on the you know the so-called left party? What are the Democrats calling for? Well. A uh, few of them will actually come out and call for universal health care. Um, they're not really interested in pursuing these kinds of uh, more imaginative uh, policies. Um, they are, you know, talk about, well, let's, you know, provide job training for the 21st century and figure out how we're going to get people to work in the technology sector, et cetera. Uh, I don't think it's good. I don't think that is a workable answer to this kind of structural 
uh, problem. And so, um, you know, if that's a populist uh, response, then um, I think it's uh, one worth exploring. You know, you mentioned regressive tax policies, so it's worth remembering that we have one of the most regressive tax policies in the country in this state. That certainly fixing that would do moves a little bit towards more equity. What's your qu name and what's your short so, question, uh, sir? My name is Tom, and so the question follows directly on that. When, it, when I try and think about a centrist populist, um, how can a politician, uh, you know, build a build a, uh, a, a, a following, a populist following with these complex ideas. I mean, I think that's, that's the key issue. Uh, people want to get elected, and they fall back on simplistic uh, notions. And uh, these kind of problems require a lot of thought and, and care. And is it, is it conceivable that you could have a populist movement in support of, as someone else asked, policies that actually have a chance of working? That's a great question. I mean, the decline of the power of political parties has certainly led to extremes in Congress, much less cooperation going on. Is there any way to kind of solve that or deal with that issue? Um, well, so, so one, one of the other things that I think has given rise to populism today is, is changes in uh, what, what we call mediating institutions, the institutions that link people to political decision making, to political power. The two most important of these are political parties and the media. And the way these operate have fundamentally changed over the last 30 to 40 years. So political parties have simultaneously become much more polarized than they've ever been. And in fact, if you look at the polarization index in our Congress, it is steeper than it's been since the 1870s, since we've had these two particular political parties. And what that measure is, is a, a measure of bipartisan voting. Do Democrats vote with Republicans, Republicans vote with Democrats? That is less likely to occur today than any time since we've had these two particular political parties. So our parties have become very polarized, but at the same time very weak as institutions, meaning they can't control who gets elected. And they can't control who gets elected for lots of reasons. Two of the major ones is the shift from using caucuses to going to primaries for selecting our candidates. And the other is the way we run our campaigns, the move towards media-centered campaigns. Both of these have cut the political parties out of who our candidates are. So if, if you wanted to be, get elected you know, in the 1950s, the way you would do that is you would get involved with a local political party, you would build a base of support in that political party, you'd run for a local office, you'd build a base of support in your state political party, you'd run for a statewide office, then you'd build a base of support that allows you to move on at the national level and build a base of support at the national party level because you needed partisans to go to the caucuses to nominate you and you also needed the partisans to go out and canvas, to ring doorbells, to tell people to vote for you, to stand on street corners. Today, how do you get elected? How did Donald Trump get elected? You go to a special interest group, you get and write you a check, you produce campaign ads, and then you beam yourself directly into homes. You bypass the parties completely, and in fact, you see the parties as a hindrance. Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders both saw the parties as an opposition to them. So our parties, the way they operate today have opened themselves up to outsider-style candidates, populist-style candidates. That's why we have people like Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders as successful candidates these days, because our parties are very weak. So one of the things we could look at if we don't like populism is strengthening political parties that, so that they can control who, in fact, becomes candidates. This is also an explanation for the Tea Party movement. It's because the Republican Party establishment, the par Republican Party itself was very weak in controlling who could be the candidates for their own party. So one thing to look at is strengthening political parties. I might, you know, in terms of uh, how to actually solve some of these uh, problems that populism is a response to, I'm not sure that building the center is the answer or strengthening the parties. Um, I think the alternative, which is what some left-wing populists are trying to do, right, is to build coalitions from their side outward, and um, uh, which is the complete opposite, right, of what the mainstream Democrats would uh, would like to keep doing, which has been their path, uh, which they've you know they've, they failed horribly with in 2016. So. Um, I, I would actually suggest kind of the, uh, the opposite, that there is at least the possibility, right, of mobilizing populism in 
uh, a more productive way, again, in a way that is not anti-pluralistic, right, but is actually able to link people with different struggles uh, to see the commonalities of their struggles against, uh, right, the, uh, shall we say it, the elite. So that's a, that's a rather different kind of answer. Um, Let me just say, you can, have, you can have very strong parties that are populist. That's basically what the New Deal Democratic Party was, an extremely strong party and a very populist party. So, so, but if you have weak political parties, what you do is you, uh, you allow so-called outsider candidates in, and that can be good or it can be bad. Oftentimes it's very bad. I mean, <laughs> Donald Trump, Donald Tr the Republican Party, you know. So, so if you went back to the original populist period, William Jennings Bryant, was nominated by the People's Party to run it for, uh, for, for the presidency. He was also simultaneously nominated by the Democratic Party, so he was on a fusion ticket, the Democrats and the People's Party. Uh, the Democratic Party establishment thought of William Jennings Bryant the exact same way the Democratic Party establishment thought of Bernie Sanders and the Republican Party establishment thought of Donald Trump. They saw them as hostile takeovers of their party. So, so um, you know, the question of party strength is separate from whether or not you, um, you, you, the party itself embraces populism. I think we're much safer to have populism as part of a strong party system. You want a party that can actually make good on real populist pledges, if, if that's what you want. If you want to see redistribution of income and wealth because you think that's what we need, you want a party that can deliver that for you. You don't want some outsider candidate who comes in and doesn't have the support of a party that can deliver. Parties are the mechanisms for, of, of responsibility and democracy. So we shouldn't fear parties, but we should make sure we have good party leaders, good parties. I'm gonna wrap up the public session now, but can you guys stick around for a little bit longer if people wanna ask you questions? Let's give a big hand for Cornell and Nick. Appreciate it. Great job. And thank you very much for your attention.